We are glad you're here with us today, whether you're in the room or with us online, wherever you're at in the world. Would you stand with us? Let's sing this song together, please. There's a call comes ringing for the restless race. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. Christ-like spirit everywhere we found. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from joy to joy. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Then stop, grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the This is my prayer in the desert When all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer in my hunger and need My God is the God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness of trial shall remain I will rejoice I will declare God is my victory and he is he my prayer in the harvest with faith 
river in Providence flow. I know I feel to be emptied again. The seed I've received, I will sow. Please be seated. We're going to join in a time of communion together. So if you are online with us, we invite you to do that as well, to find some crackers and some juice where you're at while I'm talking. And if you're here in the room, you should have received some, some bread and some juice. And if not, there are along the back there, and we have servers that will give them to you uh, if you still need those. Uh, this morning, I want to share with you my, my heart is heavy for our brothers and sisters in U Ukraine. We are still going through this, and uh, especially that last verse, God just brought to my mind that, uh, that verse that we sang, this is my prayer in the battle, when triumph is still on its way. And we have brothers and sisters in Ukraine uh, today who are probably worshiping together and taking communion in the midst of hearing rockets go off and things like that. So I would like us, before we take communion, to say a word of prayer for them, and then we'll, uh, we'll join in a time of communion together. So let's, let's do that right now. God, I thank you for all of the people over in Asia, and I pray that you would be with them, especially today, as they worship you in a time of uncertainty. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus that is not uncertain, that covers us no matter what situation we go through. So, God, we lift them up to you. We pray that you would give them some extra hope today and that you would be praised in whatever happens. And, God, again, as, as we've been praying, that you would make some good come out of this, that your kingdom would advance somehow as only you can, as only you can make that happen. God, we pray that that would happen to your glory and to your honor. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you should have some bread. It's the top portion of your cup, if you would open that right now. And Jesus himself called himself the bread of life. And as we celebrate communion, remember that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So in this moment, as we remember Jesus on the cross, remember as we take the bread we are doing this to remember Jesus and his sacrifice for us. You can take the bread now. The Bible says, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. You can take the juice now. Let's pray together. God, your presence is what we seek today. And we acknowledge your presence in this room and your love for us, no matter what circumstance we're in. In the good times and in the bad, we will sing, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name because of who you are and your love for us. So, God, we do want to proclaim our love for you in this next song. May you be praised in how we sing. And most of all, God, that you would be praised as we leave this room today. That our lives would reflect, reflect our love for you. And that our love for you would be manifested in true service. And to see people come to you and, and your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just sing this with me, please. My Jesus, I love thee. I know how I die for thee. All the follies of sin I resign. Redeemer, my Savior. 
Let's sing this last song together. There's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor full of my soul. I can say, standing. You may be seated.
Peace in the storm. That is what we're here to talk about today, finding peace with God in the midst of our struggles and circumstances, whatever they may be. If I haven't had a chance to get to know you, I'm Pastor Nate. I'm the youth pastor here. I'm sorry if you were expecting Pastor Steve. Hopefully we can still have a good time this morning. Um, as, when I think about having peace with God, um, I think of a specific story from my days in college. Um, and I think I'm seeing a couple smiles from my students in the room because some of them have heard this story before and they know where it's going. Um, but when I was in college, obviously as a ministry major, uh, I went to IWU, Indiana Wesleyan University. And one of the classes I had to take was on spiritual disciplines, which basically meant we talked a lot about reading the Bible and praying in different ways to sort of do that and analyze scripture and approach God in prayer. And it wasn't uncommon during these class sessions to practice what it is we were talking about. So it wasn't uncommon for our professor to say, all right, here's one way to study scripture. Go in and pray on this. Go and spend, spend some time in prayer in this specific way or, or whatever. And so we'd spread out in the room, or, or when it was nice, we'd go outside, and we'd be sitting on the grass or laying down, and sometimes they'd dim the lights. And some of you know where I'm going with this. Many of us would fall asleep. Of course, that was never me, okay? Uh, yes, it definitely was me. My wife will tell you I can fall asleep in probably 30 seconds flat. It's not hard for me to fall asleep. And so I was one of them who would often fall asleep during these prayer times. And, and once everybody started moving again to go and rejoin the circle, you'd hear the rustling, and you'd wake up and wipe it out of your eyes and go and join the circle and find something spiritual to say about your time with God. And... Uh, prefer specifically that before you fell asleep, right? And, and one day during our discussion, one of, a, one of a, my classmates was just really honest. I was like, you know what, Prof? Uh, I'm just going to be honest. I fell asleep. And so the rest of us are all sitting there waiting to see what, they, what she's going to say. And, and she, she pauses for a second, and she looks, at, uh, she looks at my peer, and she says, well, you must have really been at peace with God then. That's okay. <laughs> and so... I hope you find peace with God this morning. I hope it's not in that way, all right? I hope I don't put you to sleep, um, but I do hope that through this, we can, we can sort of explore the question of how do we find peace in the midst of crazy, chaotic, sometimes painful circumstances. It's not hard to come up with a list of things that might be weighing on us. I think if we all sat here for a minute, it would get pretty long, if we thought about it long enough. You don't have to look far to find it. It's on our news feeds. It's on um, our televisions. It's in our personal lives. Our friends are talking about it. Whether it be the war with Ukraine and, and Russia that we prayed for earlier, whether it be rising prices in gas or, or food or energy costs that's, that's causing our budgets to tighten up a little bit, Maybe it's a broken relationship that you're hurting for, or maybe a friend or family member that you're worried about for one reason or another. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's you're looking for a job, or you'd rather get out of the job you currently have, or, or you don't want to lose your job, or you're overwhelmed in your job. 
Maybe it's that growing or never-ending to-do list at home or in life that just never seems to get shorter. Or the pressures of always trying to be the best spouse or parent or friend or family member that you can possibly be. There are no shortage of things that can weigh on us and steal our peace. And if I'm honest with you, this message has been one of the hardest messages that I've had to put together. And to be honest, it's because I have struggled to find peace in some of these days for many of these reasons that I've listed. And so as I wrestled with this, and as I asked the question, how do we find peace in the midst of our storm? A thought came to me. And I don't, you, I don't hear God in audible voices. Some people do. I'm not one of them. But I have found that when I'm seeking him, he is faithful to reveal himself. And it's often through these thoughts. These thoughts that I know aren't my own, that guide me down a path that he, he wants me to explore. And that thought was the simple phrase of peace that surpasses understanding. Some of you are shaking your heads. You know that that is a reference to a Bible verse found in Philippians. And so that's where we're going to camp out today in Philippians chapter 4. Because this is the passage that I began to wrestle with. And as you turn there in your Bibles or, or on your devices, I want to make sure we understand something about Philippians. And that's that we call it a book, but it's, it was really a letter. All of our New Testament books were initially just letters written by early believers to other believers to help them work out their faith, to help them learn about who Jesus was. And Philippians was written by a guy who initially went by the name Saul. He was so convinced that Jesus was not God, that he was a false prophet, and that everyone following him was a danger to Israel, that he made it his life mission to end Christianity. He took it personally and began arresting, persecuting, beating, even overseeing executions of early Christians. And so if you're with us today and you're not sure what you think of this Jesus guy, Paul's your dude, okay? Paul's your guy because he was convinced that Jesus was not God until he met him for himself. Until he had this encounter with Jesus to where he could no longer deny that he was God, Saul changed everything about his life. He changed his name to Paul, and he went from being a Christian persecutor to a Christian missionary. And as a missionary, he began, then became the recipient of persecution. He received countless beatings. He was stoned and left for dead. He was shipwrecked on an island on the way to prison. He was arrested several times and was eventually martyred and killed for his claim that Jesus was God. And it was during one of these prison stints, possibly his last one in Rome, where he writes this letter to the church in Philippi to believers that he had met earlier on in his missionary journey to, in part, encourage them during their struggles. A man in prison, in a storm, encouraging others who are being persecuted in their own storms. That's where we meet Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. He writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We're going to pause right there. That is the passage that God brought to my mind. And so as we begin to unpack this, I want to clarify some language here. Because in our day, 21st century America, we now use anxious or anxiety to describe a diagnosable disorder, anxiety disorder, which is not what Paul's talking about here. Those with some sort of anxiety disorder have a hard time controlling where their minds go at times. And so Paul wasn't talking here about that. He wasn't talking about that, that chemical thing that's going on in your brain that makes it hard to steer your, your mind in the right places. No, another way to translate anxious here and the Greek word used for anxious here is translated as worry in other parts of the Bible. And so I think worry is a more clear term to use. And so that's, I hope you're okay with me using that term in its place today. Do not worry about anything, but in every situation, instead, present 
your circumstances to God. That is what I think Paul wants us to get out of this first and foremost. That's in every situation, the first step to finding peace is to present your circumstances to God. You see here, Paul wasn't reprimanding us for worrying. It happens, okay? He, it was in part a correction, but what he's really doing here is giving us the path to stop worrying. The first step in figuring out how to stop worrying is to talk to God about it. Why is that? Well, I've recently heard it said that the things that we worry about most probably reveal that, probably reveal what you trust God with the least. What you worry about most perhaps reveals what you trust God with the least. And think about it who do you talk to when you're struggling? People you trust. When I'm having a bad day, when I'm frustrated by something, when I'm upset, when I'm down, I want to go home and talk to my wife. I want to go home and talk to Chelsea. Because even though she usually has no power whatsoever over what it is that's bothering me, I know that by talking to her, I will feel better. I know that she will help me feel better. I know that she will help guide me to make the right decisions when I'm caught up in my emotions. I know that she will comfort me if I'm struggling. I know that talking to her helps. Because I trust her, I can do that. And so when we choose to talk to God, we are choosing to put our trust in him. When we take our circumstances to him through prayer, we are choosing to trust. That is step one in trusting, is to let somebody in on what is happening in your life. And yes, God knows everything. He already knows what's happening. But just like any relationship, the more you let people in, the deeper that relationship goes. And, and science and research has proven that just by talking about what's happening in life, your brain is able to process it differently. And that helps you feel better even just by talking. So even the mere act of praying can help. But beyond that, you are talking to the God of the universe. The God who made you, the God who has power over everything, and the God who loves you, cares enough to listen, and will be with you and help you through it. Friends, the first thing we need to do is simply pray about it. And when we do, Paul gives us a promise here. Let's read verse 7 again. When we give our circumstances to God, then the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your hearts, and your minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, that's an if-then right there. That is a causation. When you give things to God, his peace will guard your heart. And notice it says guard. When you're in continual prayer and conversation with God, not only do you get peace in the moment, but he guards you from worry in the future. It is not just a momentary thing, it is not just a quick fix or a band-aid solution, but it sets you up with protection for future stress and worry. And I know that trust is built. If you didn't know me and I walked up to you and said, hey man, come do this, trust me, you're not just instantly going to trust me. <laughs> trust is built. And so I know that we also have to build our trust with God. God has to build trust with us. We have to learn to trust him. So how do we do that? Well, thankfully, I think Paul explains it if we continue reading. In Philippians 4, continuing in verse 8, he says, Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. You see, how do we grow our trust in God? How do we find peace in the middle of a storm? We focus on what God has already done for us. We focus on what he has already done in our lives. All of these things, things in your life that is true, things that are lovely, things that are admirable, things that you praise God for, it was all given to you by him. And we know this in part because of, uh, of another book or another letter that another early church leader wrote. It was written by James, the brother of Jesus, which, by the way, how much would it take to convince you that your sibling was God? Okay? 
That was James. He had to come to the point in his life where he was like, all right, yeah, the dude I shared a bunk with is God in the flesh. That is the man who wrote these words. He wrote, every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. That's James 1, 17. And there we are affirmed that every good thing in your life comes from him. So let's just pause for a moment and close your eyes. Humor me for a second. Don't fall asleep, but close your eyes and picture what this might describe for you. What is it in your life that is true or noble or good? What is it in your life that when you are with them or doing this, everything just feels right? What in your life is pure? Do you, what is it that you love? What do you admire? What is excellent? What do you praise? What is worth praising God for? You can open your eyes and whatever you are picturing, that was given to you by God. Whether you believe in him right now or not, he gave that to you already. And in doing this, in reflecting on those things, we can recognize that God has been for us there before, and so we can greater believe that he'll be for us there again. And if you're having any trouble picturing something, there is no greater example of God's provision for us than in his son Jesus who stepped out of the perfection of heaven into the grime and mess of our world to die for your sins and to raise back to life for all of the stuff that you have done wrong. That's the way God has been there for you. And this this Bible, though, it's, it's filled of past examples of God's provision. So anytime you doubt that, you can open it up and remind yourself that he can be trusted. And let me say one quick thing, and maybe I'm preaching to myself here, but it's really easy to reflect on these things and begin to avoid our problems, is it not? It's really easy, at least for me, to step into my time with friends, to to play games with my buddies, to, to spend time with Chelsea, to put in a good action movie or flip on a good show on TV and just avoid the problems of the world. To maybe even numb myself to what is happening. And those can all be good in in and of themselves, but using what God has given you to avoid problems is not always, is not the answer. Avoidance is a fair coping mechanism, all right? Let me say that. Avoidance sometimes helps protect us in the moment and get past the intensity of emotions, but it is meant to be a temporary thing. At least in psychology. It's meant to be a temporary thing. And with God, we're supposed to reflect on these things as a temporary relief and reminder of who he is. Not to camp out there and ignore what is happening. Not to hide or to avoid the struggles of life. Because that's futile. They'll always catch up. But to strengthen us. To remind us that the God who did that is the God who will help you through whatever it is that's next. And so if we can do that, if we can reflect and remind ourselves what God has done in our past, then Paul has another promise. Look back at verse 9. There's another promise. In the second half of verse 9, he says, If you do this, then the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. That's his second promise. And I think that's the third thing we need to learn today. That's if we want to have peace in the storm, if we want to have peace with God, we have to actually be with God. God. We have to recognize that God is with us. That God is with you. And I say recognize because God is never not with you. He is always with you. But sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we lose sight of that. And it's when we lose sight of that that we get caught up in our fear. That we get caught up in our worry. Because friends, peace is not something that we can achieve on our own. And peace is not even something that God sends us from afar. Peace is something that we experience when we recognize God's presence in our circumstances. Peace is something we experience when we acknowledge that God is here. And I think that is beautifully illustrated in Acts chapter 27. 
The book of Acts, I love the book of Acts so much. It's such, a, it's such an awesome depiction of the early church. After Jesus raises from the dead, he appears to a bunch of people, and he goes back to heaven and sends us the Holy Spirit. And the book of Acts talks about what the Holy Spirit does in and through the lives of the early believers, including Paul, who wrote this letter. And Luke, who was Paul's personal doctor, what a job that must have been, who was Paul's personal doctor, wrote down this account of what happened to him in chapter 27. Paul has been arrested. He's being shipped off on a boat to Rome to testify before Caesar. And Luke writes in verse 14 that they come into a storm with winds of hurricane force, is how my NIV Bible translates it. Hurricane force winds. And they're in this storm for three full days. For three days, they are, they are bailing water. They are throwing things overboard. They're doing everything they can to not go under, to fight the wind and the waves and the rain. And after three days, they start to give up hope. In the midst of a literal life-threatening storm, they begin to give up hope. Until Paul speaks up in verse 22. Paul says, now I urge you, keep your courage. Because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God whom I belong and, and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in, the God, in God that it will happen just as he told me. Friends, in the midst of a very literal storm, a life-threatening storm, perhaps a hurricane, Paul says, have no fear, God is here. That is the only reason why he's able to stay calm there, because look at verse 23. He said, last night an angel of God stood beside me. God wasn't watching from afar. He wasn't saying, good luck, Paul, it'll be... Hang in there. He was, he was there. He was saying, I am with you in this, and I will get you through this. Paul was at peace because he knew God was with him. And friends, sometimes we need reminded of that. Sometimes we need reminded of that from our friends. Sometimes we need to find ways to remind ourselves of that. Because if we truly believe in an all-powerful, all-loving, and all-present God, then we can rest no matter how chaotic the world is. Then we can be at peace no matter what is happening in our lives. We can trust him no matter what happens. And now does that mean that life will be perfect? No. Does that mean that the worst case scenario won't happen? I wish I could say it does, but it doesn't. Because if you follow Paul's story, God intervenes here, but Paul ends up being killed for his faith in Rome. If you look back at the stories of the disciples, they were all killed for their faith. All but one who was exiled. Yes, sometimes God does intervene. Sometimes God does calm the storm. Sometimes God does change the diagnosis like I have seen in people I've prayed for who had this diagnosis one day and they go back for a checkup and it's gone and the doctors don't know why. It's because it was God. Sometimes God does intervene just like the stories I've heard of tanks rolling down Ukraine that run out of gas or soldiers having to ask Ukrainians for directions because they don't know where they're going. Sometimes God does intervene. But sometimes he just sits with us in the midst of it. And helps us get through it. Sometimes the diagnosis sticks. Sometimes the relationship breaks. Sometimes you lose the job. Sometimes the worst case scenario happens. And there we want an answer. We want to know why. We want to know where God is. And while I can't always answer the why, I can assure you God is right next to you. God is there crying with you. Jesus wept. God is there strengthening you in the midst of it. God is there help trying to surround you with people who can support you. God has not left you in the midst of that. And even if it brings death, which Paul did not fear if you read his letters, 
even if it brings you death, it just means you get to be with God forever. God will never leave you. And so where does that leave us today? Well, if you have never put your trust in God, you have a decision. Do you want to trust and put your trust in God, this God who died for you and who is willing to be with you in the midst of it all? Because if so, you have a chance to do that today. We're going to close in prayer here shortly, and when we do, I encourage you to pray along with me. And then to respond, to come up and talk to me or one of our elders after the service, to to message us online so that we can walk with you through this, because no one's supposed to follow Jesus alone. No one has to do life alone. Part of God's provision is to surround you with people who are seeking him as well, who can support you in it. And so if you haven't chosen to follow Jesus today, if you haven't put your trust into him today, You can do that before you leave. And if you already have, maybe you just need need to be reminded that he's with you. What can you do to remind yourself? Write it on your bathroom mirror. Ask your friends to send you a reminder text or phone calls or emails whenever you're struggling. Put it, bookmark something in your Bible, that verse that encourages you. Do things to remind you of that. Reflect on what God has given you. Instead of just complaining, Instead of posting on Facebook or grabbing everyone's ear to tell them about all the things that you're frustrated with, who does that help? Talk to someone to get the help you need and then reflect on what God has already done so that you can grow in confidence he'll do it again. And talk to him about it. Don't just talk about it to everybody else. Talk to him about it. And if talking out loud is hard for you, journal it, whatever. Write and talk. Journal. Think. He can hear your thoughts too. He can read the paper just like we can. Talk to him about it. And know that no matter what you're going through in life, no matter what is happening in the world, no matter what trials you're experiencing, God is here. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for being present this morning. Thank you for being present in Ukraine. Thank you for being present in our homes. Thank you for being present in the lives of our friends and our families, whether they recognize it or not. And God, I pray that anyone here, whether online or in person, if somebody needs to choose to follow you today, if somebody needs to put their trust in you today, Lord, I pray that they'll do so now. That they'll just simply cry out, expressing their trust in you, confessing their sins to you, asking for your forgiveness and grace, knowing that you will give it. If that's you, just just do it now. Do it now. God, I pray that you will move hearts because you love them. And God, for the rest of us who might have already been trying to follow you but struggling, increase our faith. Increase our trust in you. Remind us of who you are and what you've done. Bring to mind all the ways you provided for us, all the ways you provided for your people, all the reasons that we have to trust you. Don't let us forget that, God. Don't let us lose sight of that. Draw us near to you as you draw near to us. And remind us of your presence to give us peace. Amen. stand with us as we sing this together. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? We 
is a new creation coming it is. is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst it is. is it good that we remind ourselves of this it is Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is standing through. the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold oh, forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? For the Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is dead. been blessed uh, to be with you all today. I felt God's presence to thank you all for being here, especially you all online, wherever you're at. Glad you were here, and, and I hope God spoke to you today as, as much as he did me. Thank you, Pastor Nate, for, for, for bringing the message with us today. If you're on with online with us today, stick around for just a few minutes. We have something special for you uh, at the end of the video there, so glad you came today. <laughs> 